What's up, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of Nothing's Off the Table. Our guest for today is retired Navy SEAL, Senior Chief Bosa Mate Don Shipley. Now, if you have been on YouTube at all and you've ever uh, punched into the search line anything about Navy SEALs and if you ever came across Stolen Valor or Phony Navy SEALs, then you've probably come across Don's channel. Um, like I said, Don's retired Navy SEAL. He joined the Navy in... 1978, went through BUDS in 1984. Um, he served on teams one and two, amongst other various um, units. And uh, he's just an all-around good, down-to-earth dude. Um, funny, funny, great, uh, great interview with him. Anyway, as usual, sit back, relax, get yourself a drink, and enjoy the show. You're listening to Nothing's Off the Table, the podcast where nothing, well, almost nothing, is too taboo to discuss. On Nothing's Off the Table, we give everyone and everyone a say. We may not agree with or even like the topic, but we're happy to give you a voice, listen to your perspective, and maybe offer our own. Nothing's Off the Table is a Madsys Productions podcast. Find us on Facebook, Instagram, and on iTunes. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to another episode of Nothing's Off the Table. I'm your host, Andy, and unfortunately, Chad, again, is, has ditched me, and he's in Maine seeing his son or some crazy shit like that. But anyway, our guest tonight is uh, the one, the only, retired uh, Navy Bosa Mate Senior Chief SEAL, uh, Don Shipley. Don, welcome to the show, my friend. Well, thanks for having me, uh... Glad to be here. Let's uh, let's let's do something cool, man. All right, um, I'm keeping my clothes on. I just want you to know that right now. <laughs> Thanks, I, I, I appreciate that. <laughs> well, you said something cool, and and I'm a submariner, so what can I say? Um, but some uh, of my best fondest memories were on submarines as a seal. Now, I, I granted, I was not on there anywhere. You know, a week, ten days at a time. But you guys really looked out for us, and uh, we were restricted to sleeping on torpedoes. I mean, we could barely leave the forward torpedo room, only to go get chow, mm -hmm. and then we'd have to get back in there sleeping on the torpedoes, <laughs> but uh, a great chow, and uh, very cool operations with the submarines that we would do, and that was one of my fondest... Uh, but you guys really took care of us. But the, one of the fondest things I had, the most hair-raising or coolest thing I ever did was uh, uh, having a submarine snag us at night. And what we would do is we would go get locked off of the submarine, locked out of the submarine, go in, hit our target, come back out, and we would stretch a 100-foot cord between the two boats and we would raise these uh whip antennas up you know these 10 foot antennas we'd put in high r chem light on them mm -hmm. and you know just i remember the first time we did it was just a, a beautiful clear moonlit night and out of nowhere this submarine just surfaces and here it's coming it's coming right for us it's coming straight between those two lines and it snags us, and as soon as it pulls us around the sail, we each grab onto the other Zodiac boat, and she comes high and dry, and we just break that shit down as fast as we can to get below, and she just dives. So mm. it was very cool seeing a sub you know, surface like that, and here it's coming right for you. I had great times on a sub. Love the sub surface. I, I can only imagine um, that perspective. That's crazy. Uh, yeah, you guys looked out for us, man. Well, you know, somebody's got to, I guess. Um, Silent service, baby. Yeah. You, you would think that until they start running their mouths in the bar, but um, anyway. Well, seals, too. Have you ever saw that, uh, what was that uh, spoof video they put up, the seal that shot Bin Laden? Oh, <laughs> I know what you're talking about. you ever see that video? Yeah. That's about as accurate as it gets, you know. I don't know how you'd ever keep a secret like that. But uh, <laughs> yeah, if I if I'd have shot Bin Laden, I'd have been down at my mailbox and holding up a big piece of plywood saying I shot that guy. So <laughs> that's a tough thing to uh, keep. And uh, yeah, Rob, I know Rob real well. We were team two together, and Rob's a really good guy. Mm -hmm. And uh, things catch up to you, man. You know, it's big news. I mean, how. How big is that, killing bin Laden? I mean, it's like killing Hitler or something. I mean, it doesn't get any bigger than that. No, it doesn't. And Rob's sure a really good guy. So, so um, 
I, I have had the the pleasure of working with Sock Pack um, in my career and working with some seals, and, and it's been my experience from an outsider's perspective. But there's generally, and this is my opinion only, there's generally two types of seals: the ones that are really cool, laid back, and and you know the the quiet professionals that you are, and then there's the really cocky, arrogant assholes. So. Um, I don't know, uh, from an insider's perspective, would you agree? Would you say I'm full of shit, which is perfectly fine, but. Well, you'd have to give me an example of who you're talking about, because, I mean, every branch has that. And I know there's, uh, you know, seals writing books and things like that. And we're all, we all run around with different types of personalities mm-hmm. and, and things like that. But do you have an example of yeah. exactly what you're talking about? Yeah. So when we were in the Philippines in 2002 for Enduring Freedom, and uh, so I was I was the senior medical guy for my debt, and uh, I went into we were, where were we at? I went into where we were staging, and had where the seals medical, they had a chief with them, and they had a, uh, a second class at the time corpsman because I think that was before they they switched over to SOs if I'm not mistaken. But um, so I just I was trying to coordinate, you know, in case we had any casualties, what we're going to do, we're going to medevac, we're going to treat, what we're going to try to treat, what we're going to try to send out. And uh, I was talking to the the second class seal corpsman, and he was just as uh, arrogant little fucking prick, acting like he he didn't have the time the day to deal with me, look at me, talk to me or anything. And then uh, you know I went and talked to the chief, and then of course we straightened everything out, uh, chief to chief. But it was just like, are you? That was that was my biggest example, but uh, most of the guys I've ever um, met or talked to or worked with have just been super down to earth, cool guys. Well, how were you when you were in eighty five? Oh, I was a cocky piece of shit. Okay. Yeah. Well, there's, you know, <laughs> I, as soon as you were saying that, I was thinking back as to how I was uh, as an E five, and I went through Bud's training as an E five, uh-huh. and. They should have hung me at airborne school, my entire class. They should have just taken us out and executed the, all of us, <laughs> as big a dicks as we were down there. Because, you know, we were young frog man. We just got out of, you know, widely the toughest military training in the world, that whole thing. And we were thrust in with a, a bunch of guys, most of them right out of boot camp that were going to airborne. And, and airborne training, Army airborne training is the finest parachute training school in the in the entire world it doesn't get any better or more professional than that to get a, a huge job to do but you are run back kind of through boot camp again mm. you have a certain time you got to go to bed you got to get up i mean you got to be you can't miss a single not a, not a single minute of training and it's critically important and we did our best to disrupt that <laughs> being young cocky <laughs> seals and they don't do that shit down there anymore. You know, the uh, Navy stopped. Navy runs its own thing. But, uh, mm-hmm. yeah, I mean, you know, when you're young like that and you're stretching your wings and things like that. But, uh, no, we've all had those moments. And that's how, you know, I always talk about longevity. I think a lot of people think that, you know, a guy gets through Bud's training and teams, goes through SQT, and, you know, he becomes a SEAL and he gets a trident. That he is the end-all, know-all of everything SEAL. Oh. And he's a fucking new guy. Right. He doesn't know jack shit. And it comes to guys like you and me. It, it, it requires longevity. It requires maturity to grow up and see your mistakes and learn from others. And you become a, you know effective leader. And you correct others that are doing that. That had been my E5. Uh, there, one of my corpsmen that I saw talking to you. I'll give you a great example. You ready for this one? I'm ready. We crossed the Atlantic. I was in Echo Platoon, Team 2, and there was just a ton of new guys in that platoon. And we deployed on the USS Ponce, and we crossed the Atlantic. We pulled in to uh, Portugal. And these guys, you know, you, they had we had to teach them how to salute the ensign, salute the officer of the deck. I mean, these guys <laughs> had never been on ships before. You know, all that shit's been forgotten through buds. I mean, you had to teach them everything about shipboard life. And we get in there, and I'm back with a few other chiefs. You know, I was in the chiefs mess up there. They're my boys. I mean, I loved them all, and I did everything with them. But I stayed up with the chiefs, and I was going out on liberty with uh, some of the chiefs on the ship. And I never cut line as a chief. I always stood in the liberty lines. I always stood in the chow lines. Mm-hmm. 
I, I didn't I didn't do that. So I'm in the back of the Liberty Line waiting to go ashore, and here comes my platoon past me. It was, I don't know, it was eight of them or something, and they go right up to the head of the line, and they cut that shit. <laughs> and I'll tell you, dude, that run all over me. And I went up there and pulled them on a line and told them to get your fucking asses back to the end of that Liberty Line and don't ever let me see you do that again. <laughs> and it, it went back to my days in the fleet, and I'm fortunate to have that experience. You know, I, I, I spent uh, uh, several commands in the fleet before I went, and I remember one day in the Lockwood, you said you were in Japan, I was in mm-hmm. Yakuska, and we were in the middle of this terrible storm been going on for days, and I sat down next to a BT, a boiler tech, on that destroyer, and he looked at me, because I was wet, and he goes, is it raining outside? And I said, dude, it's, it's been raining for three days. <laughs> you know? And he didn't know. I mean, there's, there's such these... Uh, uh, jobs on board ships and subs that you shouldn't call thankless, but then you get a bunch of seals on board that you know they, they you know they they don't know they're young guys that kind of look down on some of that or think they're better than that and that just requires maturity and good leaders to tell them you're you're not all that I tell you what the next day those turds wrote me a letter and told me uh, why we're special that's what they titled it and they went into all these uh, reasons why I shouldn't have done that. Uh, Why, you should have done that? Line. Yeah, because they're special. Oh, and I wrote them a letter back. You know, it was a little little cat and mouse thing. I guess they thought, you know, they'd get to me. And I told them why they're not special. And I said, you're not special at all. You, you've you been gifted with eyesight, health. You've had a silver spoon your whole life to get, it, to get through Bud's training and that. And, you know, reflect some of that. You know, you shouldn't be looking down on anybody. You're not yeah. standing on the top of a mountain somewhere, you know, looking down on all the other horses in the pasture you know fucking act act shut the fuck up and get back in the end of the line you well know? you know you're right i mean both times i was a second class i was pretty cocky um yeah yeah but you know that was i and you grow out of it you yeah. know you did mature in the navy and you know you, you look back at that and yeah no. did, did you, you catch what i said there what's that both times i was a second class <laughs> well, I was E4 <laughs> a couple of times, too. You know, all barroom brawling. I had quite a record in uh, there. You know, Japan, where were you at in Japan? I was in Yokosuka. Yeah, yeah me too. Now, we, we, uh, I, I'd say we're a little bit different. I got over there in 79, and no saint, you know, there were no, we called them round eyes. There were no women in the Navy over there at the time. It was all men, mm-hmm. all men over in Yakuska, Japan, and no sane Japanese woman would go anywhere <laughs> near the Han. <laughs> and uh... anybody who's not been there, the Han show, all we did was beat each other up. Now, you can, you could go to France and spend your whole life there and never see a barroom fight. You'd never see one in the Philippines. You go anywhere Americans go, British, New Zealand guys, it is just fisty cups. I mean, we're just built like that. We are just warriors, and if there's no unfriendly faces to fight, we'll fight our own. So the barroom fights were just constant uh, there, and I had my share of them. So, uh, I'm going to have to disagree you with you on one, one point, and that's Philippines, because I've been in a couple bar fights in the Philippines. but I'm talking about Filipinos. Oh, well, yeah, okay, touche. Touche. We're talking Americans, British, and New Zealand are, <laughs> are just built to fight. Yeah, I agree. So you can go to France, you go to Germany, and they, they just don't do that in bars. You don't see a bunch of Filipinos beating up on each other in barroom ball. You know, <laughs> Thailand or France. I mean, they're just not built like that. You put Americans, New Zealand guys, or uh, the Australian dudes, or the Brits anywhere, and it's just pure trouble. Absolutely. And that's all you could do was this. We had a great time over there. I loved it. So. Yeah, I've been there a couple of times. This last time I was actually stationed there uh, with my family. So I was I was pretty much semi behaved um, this past time, but you know the last couple of times on deployment that we've pulled in and um, it was it was wild, but it's it's changed so much. It's not like the old days. Um, yeah, the, the old days, dude. The old days in the uh, early '80s and '70s and stuff like that. Oh you know, yeah, I love that town. <laughs> Especially when I love getting in fights. You know, I, you know. Yeah. They well. pay some people to fight. You know, Mike Tyson and all that other yeah. stuff. And then there's a 
few of us are just like having a couple of bottles of Bruce Lee and a shot of loud mouth and go at a guy and just see. <laughs> That's right. You know, let's, let's just do this. There's not going to be any hard feelings. You know, I'm not going to beat the ball out of you or kick all your teeth in. Let's just throw a few fists at each other and see who's the toughest guy in this bar. Yeah, so, and, then, and then have a beer afterwards. Something. Well, not usually. You were running from shore patrol <laughs> afterwards, you know, trying to escape, you know. And then, you know, of course, that's where you start losing stripes when you see the captain. <laughs> and when you do that for a barroom fighting, that was my favorite. I look back at some of the shit I used to say. And uh, I was always in trouble for that, always in trouble for uh, fighting. And uh, my story always started to the captain. Well, sir, I was on my way home to the ship, minding my own business, when all of a sudden, you know, and he'd just look at me. But, you know, and that's where chiefs come back in. You know, I had really, really, I had my first chief in the Navy was a solid uh, boat guy in Vietnam, Brownwater Navy, hmm. a decorated and he didn't take any shit, and his guys were his guys. And when, you know, you the captain would ask your chief, how were you as a sailor, he'd get me out of trouble as fast as I would get in it. And, <laughs> you know, I learned a lot from that. And I was a good sailor. And sailors are supposed to, uh, you know, expect to go out and barroom brawl and, and learn. You know, it's a great thing about the Navy. And the military in general, the U.S. military, I don't care what anybody um, says, you know, when they really, really think about it, it's a very forgiving place. Mm -hmm. Every one of our generals, every one of our admirals, every one of our master chiefs or sergeant majors has done some stupid shit. Oh, amen. Being an E-5, first lieutenant, you know, all that. We've made terrible, terrible mistakes. Uh, and they won't overlook it, but the type of person that you are and what you're doing for the service is certainly going to weigh heavy on what you uh, get. You know, you Definitely. really want to gain something up. If you want to be that kind of guy uh, that's rating a bad discharge or something like that, you know, for doing something really, really just stupid. But all of us have made basically the same mistakes uh, doing that. And the military is very quick to forgive you and move on and you learn and you teach others how not to do that shit. That's right. <laughs> Look what happened to me, dude. Don't do that shit. So. You know, I was just telling the guys in my shop um, this week that uh, I am super proud of every good conduct medal that I have. Um, because I probably don't deserve probably at least half of them. Um, I just well, didn't, you, didn't get caught. You didn't get caught. Yeah, exactly. But um, that's a, you know how you you learn shit uh, that way too. It's it's just a great experience. You know, I love every bit of the military. Now, when and, did uh, you retire? Two thousand three, January thirty first or first two thousand. Okay. Twenty four years and thirty one great days I spent. I mean, <laughs> loved it. Loved it all. No, not all of it. Most of it, and uh, no regrets. None at all. Man. Well, you think things have changed drastically since you've been retired, but. Um... Uh, I I actually made chief in '03, so good good year for you, good year for me. Um, but uh, go well, you know they say the the more things change, and I know where you're going uh, that now. It is not my navy, and I would struggle in it. Mm -hmm. But we had all those changes coming up, you know. Oh, sure. You did, and I did, and they really. You know, this whole political correctness thing, one of the things that uh, I got on about you know, yesterday, I, never mind. It was Colonel Robert Mosby. He was a Confederate colonel. And if you read his book, The Gray Ghost of the Confederacy, he was probably, he was one of the original commandos, the original Green Beret, the original SEAL. This guy was taking cavalry troops behind enemy lines and capturing generals out of their beds at night and spanking them with a sword hmm. and uh, hanging Custer's men, and Custer would hang his men. It was a, a, a unbelievable what this guy was capable of with uh, you know a, a lot of good men on horseback. And uh, Jefferson Davis, because his, uh, his group was called Mos Mosby's Raiders, Jefferson Davis made him change that to Mosby's Rangers hmm. because of political correctness. And when you look back, and he, he had a heart attack when they, Jefferson Davis did that, the president <laughs> of the Confederate States said, no, that's, that's a little unpolitically correct, and made him change that back during the Civil War. Things are always evolving, and things are always going to you know uh, change, and the guy's got to change with him a little bit. But sure. 
We'll always be strong. We'll always have a fine military. So. Oh, yeah, you know, every generation says the same thing. You know, it's it's just just not the same as what it used to be. My dad said that. You know, my my chiefs coming up said that. I've said it. Yeah, it'll. You're right. The more it changes, the more it stays the same. Really, but. Um, <clears throat> Again, I'd be in the if I went back to the Navy for one day, I'd be in the brig. <laughs> Probably so. Probably but, so. You know, if yeah. I was you know, if I was graduating boot camp today, it'd be a good day for me, and you wouldn't really know the difference, would you? Nope, sure wouldn't. You'd only hear old stories, and you know, wow, you know, that sounded really cool, but you'd roll. Mm-hmm. Um, getting back to what you were saying earlier about. Uh, people either being quicker or good chiefs keeping their their sailors out of trouble um and and i want to tell you this story because it segues nicely into what you do uh i i had this sailor that um it was brought to my attention that he was wearing a, a purple heart and a dive pin and an fmf pin and and this kid was an e3 and hadn't been anywhere done anything so i pulled him into the office and i told him hey if you're doing it, knock that shit off. Well, a couple of weeks goes by, and and uh, again, I've had a couple of people come to me and tell me about it. So I brought him in the uh, I brought him in the chief's mess, and I was just going to counsel him. I had a counseling sheet, and I told him, I said, "Here's here's your opportunity. Before you say anything, keep in mind I know the answer to every question I'm going to ask before you answer it. So here's your opportunity to come clean. Where are you doing it? No, chief. No, I wasn't doing it." And I told him, I said, look, here, here's your counseling sheet. This, this, you know, just man up, tell me you were doing it, knock your shit off, and we can go from there. But if you lie to me one more time, I'm going to send you to the captain. And uh, sure as shit, he, he just uh, went known up to him, so we did. We sent him to captain's mess and eventually ended up kicking him out because he was a, a grade-A shitbird. But, you know, I, I really tried with that kid to keep him, you know, from getting in trouble. Gave him opportunities, and he just kept going down the wrong path. But which leads me to how did you get into? Um, there had to have been at least one incident. I mean, I know why you do it, but what one incident sparked your your um, fire, if you will, for exposing these douchebags? Well, I will get to that, but I'm going to tell you another quick story. Okay, uh, I'm going to one up you with the kid <laughs> that uh, was wearing the awards. And at Great Lakes, Illinois, where Navy boot camp is, they have two SEALs up there. Uh, mm-hmm. They're SEAL motivators. They give the PRT test and a physical test for the guys that want to be SEALs. Mm-hmm. And one of them is a, a great, great friend of mine. He's been down here hunting with me before. We went through buds together. We've done everything together. And he went to the Navy Exchange to get a trident. He was the chief petty officer up there to get a new trident. And the woman at Great Lakes told him uh, that they didn't have any more. They were sold out. And he said, well, when we get some more? And she said, uh, well, they're our best seller. Oh, Jesus. And he said, what? There's only two seals up there. She said, oh, they fly off the shelves. We, we, we can't keep them in stock. <laughs> and these are guys graduating boot camp that are going home on leave, and they're wearing a flipping trident and stuff. But... It's hard to say where my start really came from because, you know, when we were on active duty and stuff, and, yeah, I I swam from the shore patrol for a long night for beating up a phony (laughs) seal over there. But I think my biggest one came with a uh, guy that was, uh, well, I know it did. uh, He was donating stuff to my training courses, donating really nice rifles. And we've had that happen before. Uh, guys would donate. They'd see the work I did with kids with cancer, and that's what he said. You know, this is over the Internet. Duh. <laughs> and he loved the work I was doing with the kids with cancer. Let me do all this stuff. One thing led to another. And here he comes uh, dragging his lumpy ass down there to my training course in the middle of hell night, we called it. Uh, you know, a big 24-hour marathon for these guys. He shows up around midnight. Said he was a Marine that uh, had his head crushed in a helicopter crash in Panama. He was shot all up through the belly, and when the halo went down during the invasion of Panama, it crushed his head, and you know he couldn't walk, and you know, he was in a wheelchair, and he recovered. This is just a long, long, long-ass story, and I labeled that guy a, a hero mm-hmm. in front of about 25 young, impressionable minds that are there for a SEAL training course, Extreme SEAL Experience. And then this guy started telling, because I'm very busy that night. Next day, we get up and we're around the fire having a beer. And 
he starts talking about this snake climbing in this sleeping bag and uh, biting him when he was a Marine. And he pulls up his big chubby arm and he shows these two little marks and it starts telling these stories that you would never tell to another veteran. You know, I think my grandma used to tell me stories of snakes getting in bags. I mean, that shit doesn't happen. And then a firefight in Cuba when he was a Marine, it turned out to be a deer that they killed and they, they all ate the deer. And so we were PTing the guys. Uh, this dude had complete access to my computers to do his work and stay in the house with me and Diane and my daughter. And I talked to a uh, buddy. I've done some videos of him. It's uh, Matto, Master Chief Matto. And he was at Deb Group, and he went into Panama, and he was going to run PT for these guys the next morning. And afterwards, you know, I had introduced uh, Mark to him, and I said, uh, hey, Matto had a very strange look on his face. He turned away when that guy extended his hand to shake it. And afterwards, I said, dude, is there a problem? Hmm. And he goes, that dude had been in front of all those kids. I'd have punched his lights out. He goes, there were no helos shot down in Panama. That guy's a total fraud. Hmm. And sure enough, he was. And uh, uh, he was suing the VA. He would sued the VA repeatedly. He was a guy that would handle your disability service records. He had access to you and everybody else. Jesus. And suing the VA for all these things. And, uh, I got him thrown in jail. He went to prison for wire fraud uh, for doing that when we dug deeper into it. It absolutely inflamed me that uh, what I had said about him to these young impressionable minds. And uh, we found out he was a gate guard in Nairobi. He <laughs> was in the Marines and he served in Nairobi at the embassy over there and nothing more. All of it was a fake and the VA was very interested in that. Because he was on an ultra level of disability for his wartime injuries, and he made all that shit up himself. Hmm. I just don't and get so, it. Yeah. Well, that was really the turning point for me. I got really angry. And then uh, the first guy I did, uh, Phony Navy Seal of the Week, uh, was a guy that was giving training advice to a young kid. And when I called him out on it, he threatened to have me killed by his uncle and the Gambino crime family, and I just got mad about it. And that's where phony Navy SEAL of the Week started. I said, I've had enough of these guys. So, hmm. Well, I'm glad you're doing it. Um, I'm sure um, m- many of your brothers are, are glad as well. Um, well, I don't, have a, I don't have a honcho in uh, Yakuska to let out my frustrations anymore. <laughs> yeah. i got to do it through a keyboard, man. Yeah, well, it sucks getting old, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah. a little bit, but you, you know, great you, age. You, you mentioned your wife, Diane. Um, how did you guys meet? I had come off my first ship in uh, Yokosuka, Japan, that destroyer, uh, with me and uh, uh, just my the, my best friend in this whole wide world. And we got assigned to the USS McKee. It was a submarine oh, tender, yeah. Point the Loma, yep. the love boat. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and we, we commissioned that ship. And it was the second mm-hmm. ship in the Navy that had women on it. There was another submarine tender that the gals went on. I think it was the Ajax or the Dixon or something. The Dixon, yeah. But we were the second or some shit, and we're all in this little pre-commissioning stage. You know, the ship isn't ready for all of us to get on board. And I was, as a third-class bosun mate, was teaching a class on kind of basic shipboard life. You know, don't spit on the decks, throw your butts over the side, mm-hmm. darken ships, curtains, you know, just things like that. And there were these two pretty girls in the back of the class, and they were just yakking They're right out of boot camp and just yakking and not paying any damn attention to me. And the one doing the most yakking turned out to be my wife. I told her, just basically, <laughs> shut the fuck up, or you can come up here and teach this flipping class yourself. <laughs> and called her out, embarrassed the shit out of her. And when class was over, she came up and asked me if I was going to ask her out or not. So... 39, 40 years ago, you know, the rest is history. Oh, that's awesome. My wife yeah. my wife just cost me two pigs and a chicken. She's from the Philippines, so, you know. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> She's going to kick my ass later. But, yeah, that's all right. It's a good thing she doesn't list these damn things. But uh, That's right. Speaking of PI, uh, I know you've been there at least several times. What is, what is your most favorite 
PI story. Well, that's, that's where I got into the phony seal thing. Hmm. You know, I've been all over the uh, Orient, all over Northern Europe, all over the Mediterranean. I've never really made it much to South America, uh, things like that, but Africa. I mean, I've been I've been really all over the the world but when you bring up the philippines i've got a lot of stories we can't go into on here <laughs> but uh Fair my enough. favorite one was uh me and a couple other young seals playing pool in subic city and there was a bunch of other big ogres in there and it turned into a fight over a quarter on the table of whose game was next mm-hmm. and this big old sluggo uh, tries to push me around and, and steal that game, and I kind of called him out. I, I did call him out. And, you know, that was the favorite thing over in the Philippines, what you would ask everybody that you encountered when there's about to be trouble is, where are you stationed at? <laughs> so I said, where, where are you stationed at? And he, he was looking me right in the eyes, and he slowly turned his head over his right shoulder, and then he slowly turned his head over his left shoulder, and he came back at me, and he made eye contact, and he said, "Seal team," and I hit that fucker right in the mouth as hard as I could. <laughs> he never even got the word six out of his mouth. It came out as my fist was impacting him right in the teeth. Uh, he had no idea who we were, and uh, I, 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 I just waylaid that guy like a, a bunch of times, and then we beat up all his friends, and then, you know, here comes OPM, Officer Provost Marshal, <laughs> trying to catch all of us, you know, and they just went into another one, and we escaped to Thailand the next day, and, you know, the world's a better place, but, yeah. yeah. <laughs> there was never many, there was never a lot of fighting that went on in the Philippines, because, you know, you had the women over there. Mm-hmm. Yep, sure. And, uh, you yeah, had a lot of beer and you had women. And the trouble goes in, uh, throughout my time and some of these, you know, with the foreign guys, was always uh, in a place where you had plenty of alcohol and you didn't have any women. And then, you know, if you're around Australians, Kiwis, or Brits, you know, the trouble's going to start. So. Mm-hmm. All the shit talking, yep, the beer's flowing, absolutely. Oh, uh, yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. <clears throat> so I, uh, you and I talked offline a little bit, but... Um, I think where I came across you was on YouTube initially, where I, I saw your first couple of videos, and um, I tried to jump on there earlier because I was going to put a uh, get get the website address and everything so we could plug it in for the show. And uh, I noticed that your your channel had been removed for violation of YouTube whatever um, snowflake policy they had, but. Um, you mentioned that you have a website, so if folks want to find you, they can go to your, your website. And, and correct me if I'm wrong, but it's videos.extremesealexperience.com. Are we talking about that or are we talking about YouTube? Oh, well, I was just saying I want to get that out first okay. so, so that we can find out where to get to you. But, yeah, let's talk about YouTube first. YouTube threw me in the Tower of London, man. <laughs> <laughs> they they dishonorably discharged me. I've never been dishonorably discharged before, but they showed me the door, and I had it coming. You know, I used YouTube as a uh, a mouthpiece for going after these phony seals, and I did a really really good job of it. Now, I pushed a lot of buttons, and I, I put a lot of grit into a lot of these guys. And a lot of my didn't. You know, I would just tell the story, and a lot of comedy. But there were a few of them that I really went after and you could watch that video and just taste the hate in my mouth for what they were doing. You know, these aren't simple seal claims or broken people out of huge sums of money and just a disgraceful discussion. Just everything about them was wrong. And I would really sink my teeth into them. And uh, I put a video up about Johan Kildridge Harrison years ago. Uh, Perhaps one of the worst. I mean, he's in the top three uh, bony seals ever. And after several years up there uh, and being slapped around, you know, I went to YouTube jail a few times. You know, (laughs) you you click on your YouTube channel and it would come all up in red uh, telling you you've got a a violation, a strike. Mm -hmm. And you'd have to take this little test and promise you'd never do it again and shit. And, you know, they punish you for six months. uh, But then they finally had enough of me. And uh, the Johan Harrison, because 
uh, I can't tell you what that, you know, the extortion flight with all the seals that died tattooed in his chest. And, oh, Jesus. You know, when he claimed a seal admiral and the money he stole from people was epic. And to take advantage of those guys like that. And Johan is just, he's such a frequent flyer. And uh, I call him that. Guys just shoot on my radar all the time. Mm -hmm. So I was, I had, that video was really, it was out there huh. of, uh, guys getting firing squad and, you know, actual footage and stuff and guys getting electrocuted to death and, you know, weird, weird things. And I really showed this taste for this guy and tried to get the word out far and wide of what he was. And after several years of that video, just laying around and people being entertained and learning by it, uh, YouTube shut the uh, channel down over the video. <laughs> so I was disarmedly discharged, run out and no hope in sight. I mean, they threw away the key on me, dude. <laughs> 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 Unfortunately for them, I have two other YouTube channels, so I will rebuild. You know, we're, <laughs> we're rebuilding here, but I don't blame YouTube for doing it. I I did break their rules, and uh, I can always admit that. And I guess if I was running a video site, you know, where we had basket weaving and <clears throat> videos of kids playing patty cake, I'd have been fine. <laughs> However, this whole stolen valor thing is just a really, really nasty thing that is growing uh, it just leaps and bounds every day. It's not even an epidemic anymore. It's a flipping pandemic. And I'm you know, one of those guys that's willing to go out and call you a liar and just, you know, give you a good spanking on the internet, which is what these guys need. Yeah. So your boy, you tried to give him a spanking. He didn't take it. And the Navy threw him out. It's the same thing I do. Mm -hmm. I don't go after all these guys. And I have turned my back on plenty of them when they would do, what I would ask, I'd often ask them, why don't you just post up on your Facebook you know, thing and tell everybody that you're sorry you misrepresented yourself as being a SEAL or the website where you're running uh, uh, pistol and rifle training to and taking people for all this money when they think you're a SEAL and tell them that uh, uh, you're sorry if uh, anyone was misled, but you were never a SEAL. And if they do that, then I would let the whole thing go. Hmm. And I never went after all of them. Most of the guys that I went after would be you contacting me and asking me, you know, if your neighbor, Bob Smith, who's flying the seal flag in his yard and telling all these crazy seal stories down at the BFW was ever a seal. And I'd merely verify that. I'd write you back a big verification letter and tell you, no, Bob was never a seal. And most people didn't like confrontation. Hmm. You would probably never confront him. It stayed between you and me, but maybe one day at the BFW, you got a couple of shots of loud mouth in you and you would call him out. And when I was doing it, you know, because I have to force myself to do this a lot, you know, confront these guys. I'm going to confront one in breakfast in California tomorrow over the phone uh, that they've set up for me. But after I started doing it, there was a lot of other guys that had no business doing it that thought that was cool and I'm going to find a phone booth to get changed in and I'm going to be like Don Shipley and I'm going to start calling these guys out at the airport and parades and terrible mistakes were made. They're no good at it. I'm very detailed, very thorough. I know how to get your records. I have everything in place before I call you out. I know you're not a SEAL. I don't fly. You know, I just good and when you're an amateur you do a lot of damage and unfortunately there's been not a lot but uh, enough guys mm -hmm. that were falsely called out for stolen valor uh, by some I don't know little junior G men that didn't rate it so <laughs> that and uh, you know the whole YouTube thing uh, I'll calm down I tried to do it but uh, I had to get the, the point across and if YouTube would have reinstated my channel Quite honestly, I'd have been breaking their rules the next day, doing it again. <laughs> sure. If not so the I same day, right? I, I had a good 10-year run, you know, but uh, and I will rebuild. So all my phony seals, all the busts are on this uh, membership website that I have that you mentioned, videos.extremesealexperience.com, or you can search phonyseals.com in your browser and get redirected there. But when I post a guy up, the website guy that runs my thing, the admin, the developer, is a very gifted guy. 
So even though it's a membership website, when I post Bob Smith, phony Navy SEAL, it, it goes number one on Google. I mean, you're going right to the top of the Google hit list. And anybody that searches your name, which is becoming really frequent with these uh, claims, can't tell you how many girlfriends and girls <laughs> and wives and people search YouTube for your name. Right. You know, Bob Allen Smith. And then they see, there it is, the video, the phony seal, and so it all works. And, you know, people want to join or see the full video, it costs them 10 bucks and stay on there a month and, you know, cancel their subscription. Mm -hmm. So even though I got off of YouTube, because they would punish me all the time, I can't tell you how many times I've been in YouTube prison, <laughs> but they've always forgiven me. That's what I did. I, I did a great video up there about me being in YouTube prison. I, I used some scenes from uh, Blade Runner with Harrison Ford. It was quite <laughs> funny. Nice. But, uh, yeah, I, I'm going to rebuild and go up. I'm not going away. And when I get a breath left in me, you know, I'll still be busting these guys. Cause honestly, dude, it's, it's your valor. It's your family's valor. You've, you've put people in your life through hell and your uncles and grandfathers and, <clears throat> and every guy in the military, Marines, Army, Navy, Coast Guard. When you bust a phony seal, you've busted, you know, dozens and dozens inside their service because they all tell the same lies. So right. It works. And I'm proud of my service in the Navy, and I'm proud of what I do busting these clowns. So Yeah, it just, you know, it really, really pisses me off. I, um, I was part of... Um, we had to lay someone to rest here last, uh, well, earlier this month, um, Scotty Wirtz, who's a St. Louis local boy who was uh, a team guy and then got out and worked for one of the letter agencies. And he was he was one of the uh, the guys killed over in Syria in that suicide yeah. bombing. Um, and that was a very, very humbling experience. I was able to take part in that. I was... Um, I was asked by the family. I was the only only photographer allowed um, in the church and at the uh, at the gravesite to take pictures. And um, it's we see somebody like that who is a true hero that gave his life up for the country. And then you go to these other freaking bozos that are trying to play the play the role. It just it infuriates me. But. I'm glad. I'm glad that you do what you do, um, because they need to be called out for sure. But uh, well, it goes, it goes really deep into this thing. And the guy I'm getting tomorrow is a, a, a complete loudmouth at a BFW huh. in California, and they're having breakfast tomorrow. And he's bringing a date, and the post commander is just going to put his phone on speaker and set it right down in front of that dumb bastard where he can't escape. <laughs> and put me on the phone. Now, this is a guy that was an operations specialist in the Navy for less than four years before they booted him out hmm. uh, for being a clown, and he is producing these uh, Navy Cross citations and Silver Stars and Bronze Jeez. Stars and all that, but uh, never mind that. Never mind that. Here's you. You are sitting on a bar stool. You're a Navy chief, and uh, you did your time. And you're sitting next to this guy who was kicked out as an OSSR mm -hmm. and has fabricated all this stuff. And your service is diminished by him. Absolutely. Now, he's one up in you. Now, let me tell you about this guy now, or any of these guys. I don't care who's in that BFW. When you have a Navy SEAL with a Navy cross, no matter all these bullshit, you diminish everyone's service in there mm -hmm. i don't care if uh, it's like the guy went after uh, up in new hampshire uh, lying about being a seal on a navy cross in vietnam but he never served there but the post commander was a marine who had lost his leg in vietnam and his service was diminished you can't here's a marine lost his leg in vietnam through a, a, a booby trap and here's this guy claimed to be a, a Vietnam guy with a Navy cross. He has diminished his service. Nobody wants to hear from that boy and lost a leg. Right. You want to hear from this guy. Right. Does that make sense? No, you 100% makes sense. Um, no, whatever honorable service you had or whatever you did, there's some clown one-upping you, and it's not right. Now, I'm, I'm looking at a picture here right now. I got this email <laughs> just before we got on the phone, and this is from a Norwegian guy who served in the Royal Norwegian Navy and somehow came across this guy 
uh, claimed to be Mac B. Sog in Vietnam. <coughs> hmm. And he gave him money. Oh, jeez. Like a lot of it. And he's posting pictures up here of this guy and gives me his name. For years, this has been consuming this guy over it. And he finally wants the truth. And uh, I'm looking at the picture of this guy dressed up like a Green Beret. I got his name. Uh, he's got a Medal of Honor. He's got a uh, Distinguished Service Cross, Silver Stars, Bronze Stars, and it's all total bullshit. <laughs> that guy is not listed anywhere <laughs> of doing any of that. And this is how far this goes. Now, this is coming from Norway and a guy that gave this guy money. And he is very pretty in this uniform, this special forces uniform of his. And I can take one look at it and go, no flipping way, dude. <laughs> so it's not just guys, you know, because we've had, for as far back as you want to go, Gettysburg, Waterloo, you name it, there have always been guys that have not served in those battles, conflicts, that will claim they did. Uh, the Martins, you know, all this stuff, it's gone on for forever because no guys lie a lot. Yeah, no doubt. But they could only project it down a few bar stools at their local pub. Mm -hmm. With the age of the internet, dude, you can be anywhere, anyone you want to be. Anywhere, anyone, any, any, anything. And you're all over these dating websites and you know, bilking people and these scams, Nigeria. It's, it's just terrible. Don't even get me started, bro. <laughs> and I haven't even had a, a full drink yet. I'm already on a roll. You can see my blood pressure going up. <laughs> it's too late. Whatever, hey, man. Hey, uh, yeah. so the the um, extreme seal experience. Are you still doing that that course that you had down there, or no, no? We uh, we ran that course. It was a great pride of mine. I retired from the Navy. I went with Blackwater and spent a lot of time with her in Pakistan, Afghanistan. And then my wife and I, because that wasn't the teams, I did not retire from the Navy to keep deploying mm -hmm. uh, like I was doing with Blackwater. And we'd always uh, enjoyed real estate. We got into that and it afforded us an opportunity to... You know, slowly retire and get away. And one night, you know, me and my wife, I tell you, what, me and my wife do, me and my wife like uh, little campfires and having drinks. Mm -hmm. And we think shit up. Me and her think just the same. And we think shit up and we're both aggressive, type A, and we will weigh out the pros and cons and we'll go for it. But we dreamed up extreme seal experience on a cocktail napkin. <laughs> and the next thing I know, my first course had a South African carpet maker in it. Over the 10 years, you know, guys from Norway, Germany, Denmark, France, China, Japan, all over South America, all over the world. Mm -hmm. And I was so flattered by that that you would come to Chesapeake, Virginia for two weeks and let me just beat the absolute dog shit out of you. you know? <laughs> yeah. We had a good time with the helos and the boats. I mean, it was a, a confidence-building course, and I was really great with the guys because I've always been one of those chiefs, you know. My big arm around your shoulder is uh, is what I did. You know, I wasn't a marker or a fighter. And that led into, uh, you know, after 10 years and getting a show in some age, you know, we... Uh, retired, moved, not retired really, but we moved up to the eastern shore of Maryland where I grew up, where I joined the Navy hmm. and started Extreme Seal Adventures. And Extreme Seal Adventures is a charity. We own this property. It's all ours. And we started this charity and we bring all these wounded guys and kids and cancer and families and, you know, the pool, the birds, the big farm and all the duck hunting, deer hunting, turkey hunting, striper fishing, jet skis, boats. It's just insane down here. And that's what we do. We enjoy entertaining from all those years of extreme seal experience and run a very, very simple charity down here. And that's that's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna I'm gonna die with a drink in my hand and a, in one hand and a goose call in the other. <laughs> there you go. Do you do you guys have a website for that? Yeah, it's all, everything I do is based off Extreme Seal. So okay. the uh, the new YouTube channel that I have, it's actually an old one. It is called Extreme Seal on YouTube, and we're getting ready to ramp that one up. And uh, to make take place of the one I got dishonorably discharged from. <laughs> <laughs> so somebody and wants to do Extreme Seal Adventures, Extreme Seal Experience. Guys can get on Extreme Seal Experience still and find the video website there okay. and get move over to there. So it's... Uh, 
we started the Extreme Seal Experience, then we're doing videos.extreme seal experience, and now the charity is Extreme Seal Adventures. So Okay. So if somebody wants to get on and, and donate, they can find it through that. Yeah, yeah. Right. It's a very uh, very it does not cost much to run this farm. I mean I've got this shit dialed down here, but we have such a great time with the guys and put a lot of worthy dudes through and a lot of the donors come down for the hunts and mm -hmm. I tell you, we've just done spectacular down here. It's really I got a big stupid grin on my face right now <laughs> just even thinking about it. But my next hunt we I brought down uh two army colonels and uh, this is for the last hunt for goose season this year and one of my members uh, the video site is a mature audience that's why I got away from YouTube I needed a backup plan but I got tired of all those little punks that were just right shit just to write shit and right. ponies and making videos and all that so I've got one and I don't put up with that shit on my video site and everybody's older mature you know it's just a great website but one of my members uh, asked, because I asked them to send me the wounded guys, you know, who would you like to see come down here and I'll get them and all that. But one of the members said, uh, you know, his uh, relative was a uh, retired Army colonel, served in Vietnam, and his son was a Army colonel, and his wife was an Army colonel, and he's got these two grandsons. And I just, I, and I just love kids. I just love, love them. I love teaching boys. My fighter pilot father raising me hunting pheasants and just all that stuff so the last time i had those uh, brought those two boys down here and uh, the grandfather was a colonel in vietnam he was a helicopter pilot and that crazy guy it's up on my website the interview i did with it hmm. that crazy son of a bitch got shot down in vietnam hmm. he pulled up with these distinguished flying cross license plates and uh, i was talking to him about that and he said, and then I fixed the uh, helo, and we took off just as they were starting to cover us up with mortars. And I said, you did what? <laughs> and he said, yeah, and I fixed it and took off. I said, you were shot down in Vietnam. He's in a Chinook, mm, oh, one of these big-ass Chinooks. Yeah. And I said, you fixed it. I said, how would you fix it? And he said, I don't know. We were on the ground less than an hour, but it was getting bad. And I started shaving the wood from ammo boxes down into plugs. And I forget, huh. we call them DC plugs on right. the ship. And he said he beat them into the holes in his, uh, uh, your uh, transmission and then put more fluid in it. And he was able to take that bird off and go fly to a nearby friendly base Get that extinguished flying cross for it. And his son is an Army colonel active duty. And his son's wife is an Army colonel active duty. And they brought those two, those boys down. Oh, man, they were just great, great kids. And we shot a lot of ducks. We shot a lot of geese. And I, in my roundabout way, I'm getting to spring gobbler season because I'm bringing those boys up for the youth hunt for turkey season. And I'm going to get them a big turkey on April 13th and 14th. And, uh, you know, that's just uh, that's just it. We do a good job up here. I love the Eastern Shore. I love Maryland. So. Well, I'm glad you're there and you're you're enjoying it and whatnot. I'm, I am a little disappointed. I, I was hoping you were still in Chesapeake because uh, I'm actually coming out there in August probably for a, uh, a buddy's retirement. And I was hoping to buy you a beer, but, well, so much for that. Were you in Chesapeake at all? Yeah, we were, uh, actually we just moved there. Um, we left last August. Yeah, I've spent about 10 years in the Virginia area, but, yeah, we were in um, Great Bridge area. Yeah, were you ever down through Moyoc? Oh, yeah. Well, that's where I lived, just on this side, the Virginia side of the Northwest River. But do you recall the liquor store in Moyoc? Uh, vaguely, yeah. It's just across the border. Dude, when we moved there, Chesapeake was the OK Corral. <laughs> Chesapeake, Virginia was the last of the gunfight, uh, just redneck gunfight thing. They had a one... <laughs> Uh, a one ring circus in Moyoc that we used to take kids to. They had one decrepit elephant, uh, some shitty camel, and uh, <laughs> none of the guys could get any acts right. And it was just comedy to even watch it. And, uh, you know, how much Chesapeake has grown up now from mm. where we were just gunslinging down there and hunting and having a great time. And, you know, it was a, just a great place to live and just the good old boys. And, uh, yeah, <laughs> and it's getting to be like Virginia Beach now. Yeah. And we, we, we needed to get out of there. So we're on the eastern shore. We're isolated. I don't have any neighbors. 
looking over my fence or any shit like that. And uh, <laughs> I just, we just hunt and just relax. You don't hear anything up here. People come, we have a, this huge barn. I bought this from a Marine. He was 91 years old when we bought it. He recently died. He served in Korea and he's just a hard, hard guy, hard hunting waterfowler. And his son, they had a big old barn on the property, they still do, but his son built a four bedroom apartment over the top of this thing huh. because the, the, the grandfather was so fond of his kids. And they just took him out here duck hunting. So when the vets come down, they get this beautiful apartment, fully furnished, stoves, refrigerators, two beds, four baths, and they just hang out down there and just booze it up, and they eat all their meals up with me and Diane, and we get up in the morning, and we go hunting, and they it's just a great place. It's a really cool place down there. Well, it sounds amazing. Um, I'm jealous. <laughs> well, we've worked hard for it. You know, we've, uh, Diane and I have, you know, that's the thing. You've got to have somebody in your life that is really... I've had friends retire as SEALs who would make good kind of entrepreneurs like that, but their wives are so stuck on getting that retirement, and we need to get a, a steady paycheck after your retirement. You've got to go to work for somebody. Hmm. You've got to go in and grind it, and they, they're afraid of it. And Diane and I have never been that way. We bounce things off, and we calculate and do it all, but we'll come up with a plan. And we'll execute that thing, and I've never really screwed anything up. So uh, you got to take some chances, man. No balls, no blue chips, type of thing. You know. That's right. Well, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to retire, and I've, I've just started this this small business here. It's a uh, multimedia business, so photography, videography, video editing, you know, drone videos, and that kind of shit. And um, that's great. I'm that's not working. Big thing, you know? Yeah, I'm not working for anybody. I'm going to work for me. Because um, those you know. drones and the way the internet is going and when I, you know, and you told me you were a nurse and I always uh, talk to people about that mm -hmm. when they, when they're in the medical profession in any way, you are in a secure position. Oh, sure. Being a paramedic, being a firefighter, being a police officer, being a nurse, being anything like that. Uh, this country isn't getting any younger and the old, there's always a need for that. Always. And now with the age of the internet and, uh, you know, the uh, the video editing, drones are the new big thing and, you know, what you can do. And so, yeah, some uh, a little bit of risk out there. But you can, with the Internet, you know, you can build something up like that and uh, be proud of it. So, yeah, yeah good for you. Man. Yeah, thanks. We're, we're excited about it. Um, and when I say we, I mean me, you know, because um, I do what I'm told by, by the wife sometimes. The couch is pretty yeah. comfortable, you know, but... Um, Listen, brother, I don't want to take up too much more of your time, but I do want to ask you one last question. And uh, it's uh, most people don't realize the significance of it, but I, I do, So, and I appreciate it. But I've got to ask, what were you awarded the Navy Marine Corps Medal for? Well, during my, I'm very proud of that award. That was my uh, Denny Chalker, you know, the, the SEAL. Mm -hmm. uh, I was written a number of books, and one he wrote was... Uh, one good op, one good operation. And during our time in the Navy after Vietnam, you know, I joined in 79, became a SEAL in 85. And through that, there just wasn't anything good uh, going on. And a lot of people think that you get out of BUDS training and you just start operating in North Korea and, you know, Cambodia and Russia and you're just killing people all the time. It's just not, it's not like that. You know, this country, especially after Vietnam, was just really worried about going back and doing any crazy shit or getting mixed up in this. And then you look at what was available, Panama, Grenada, mm -hmm. Desert Storm. You know, fuck, Desert Storm lasted 100 hours. Yeah. There wasn't anything going on there. And a lot of people think that SEALs are like the 82nd Airborne, you know, when something happens, you know, they unload everybody. If you weren't in a platoon, when Panama was going down, a deployed combat-ready platoon, uh, you weren't going. Mm -hmm. I mean, you, you, you had other shit if it wasn't in your area. So the teams are broken down into areas of operation, you know, the West Coast. You know, Team 2 took care of Northern Europe. Team 4, South America. You know, Team 8 was in a lot of Africa. The West Coast teams took care of Asia and the Persian Gulf and things. If you weren't a part of that, you weren't a part of that. So... Uh, 
there wasn't a lot going on, but I certainly volunteered for damn everything and stayed in platoons. I just humped a gun. If I wasn't humping a gun and SEAL team, I was teaching others how to hump them. Mm -hmm. But all of a sudden, Liberia came up, hmm. and uh, eight of us volunteered to go for that. I was the platoon chief. We had an officer. We had a squad. It wasn't even a platoon. The captain of the USS Ponce, because I had just gotten off of that thing, said he was not deploying without SEALs on board. And the Liberians were shooting up the embassy and eating each other again. Uh -huh. Every few years, the Liberians uh, get a good load of liquor and alcohol, and then they turn their aggression on the American embassy over there, and they meant to settle this. So my whole job in Liberia, the reason I was going over it was as a demolition expert and a platoon chief, and we were going to blow old World War II style a landing facility for boats to evacuate the embassy, get the old landing craft in there, mm -hmm. total World War II stuff. Mm -hmm. And I was uh, extraordinarily excited about uh, doing that. We were going to go in, recon that, come back, and just blow this lane because they, the librarians would shoot at the helicopters evacuating Americans. I mean, the whole situation's bad. Mm -hmm. Well, we never got to do that for a, a couple of reasons. One, because the president of Liberia had a dream <laughs> yeah, that's how strange that country is. But he had a premonition. The Americans were going to invade, and the night we're supposed to do it, that word comes out, and they stopped the whole thing because you know, they went nuts. But uh, 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 a Bahamian-registered uh, freighter caught on fire and exploded off the uh, coast of Liberia. And we were really the only package that they could have. It was uh, terribly burned, destroyed, sinking. Uh, there were a number of guys killed. Uh, they were in a terrible situation with no power. And the uh, radio station in uh, Iceland or something caught this broken traffic of these dudes, you know, and how bad this was. And mm -hmm. they launched us and uh, dropped us off on board that thing. We fast roped on board it and... Uh, Right through the middle of a typhoon, we were on that thing for 18 hours, saving those guys and keeping the ship afloat. And, you know, just everybody was so badly hurt. They were so badly burned and the guys dying, trying to get out of portholes and jumping to escape the flames. And uh, so, yeah, they gave me a Navy Marine Corps medal and the other guys. And, uh, you know, President Kennedy had one. It's the uh, highest mm -hmm. award you can get for heroism in peacetime. And, so I went into Denny Chalker's thing, one good op, and out of everything I did in SEAL Team, all the deployments I went on and all the things I wished I had done, you know, when these guys are doing it now, and that was my one good op, and that was worth all of it. There you it go. wasn't a shot fired doing it, but, uh, you know, yeah, that was cool. Well, well, thank you, brother, for doing that. I mean, that's uh, – you would have done it no matter what, but um, still a courageous act. And to me – Again, most people don't know what the the Navy Marine Corps Medal is. Uh, you know, especially now these are her Navy Marine Corps achievement or Navy Marine Corps commendation. But the Navy Marine Corps Medal is a, a super impressive award, at least in my book. So, now you're risking your life to save the lives of others, and that's the only thing about that award. You know, the uh, Army has theirs called a Soldier's Medal. Mm -hmm. I mean, you do. You know, always got a Navy Marine Corps Medal, and they think calm or achievement. And it's not. It's a very prestigious award. I'm very proud to have it. And we did a good job. And nobody else could have. So I uh, saved a bunch of those guys. Uh, my favorite was the uh, the captain on board that ship. He was a Brit. And part of the problem with that ship was they had a bunch of guys who couldn't speak English, Indonesians, uh, Filipinos, mm -hmm. Koreans, and all that stuff. But the captain was British. And the captain described to me, he said, it, uh, the fire broke out. They had an explosion in the laundry room. And now this is a big-ass merchant ship. I mean, it's a big ship. Mm -hmm. And all I could describe it is, is a flare. When you fire off a, like a road flare or something, right? that's what that thing did. It burnt through deck after deck after deck huh. like a flare, these heavy steel metal decks. And it trapped him on the bridge in the upper deck. And he said, I was burning alive. I was just surrounded by fire in a matter of seconds, and I saw a hole. And he said he jumped. I said, I ran and I jumped. And he went over the bridge wing, hit a lifeboat on his way down, uh, smashed his leg up into his hip. He just total compound fractures, exposed bones, just terrible. He hit that lifeboat on the way down, went in the water, and somehow they got that guy out of it. 
and Jeez. he'd been sleeping in his own shit uh, in there, not sleeping, but in it for uh, three days before we could get to them. It was terrible. And I hit that dude with a load of morphine and because uh, I was a paramedic uh, mm -hmm. and steel and platoon chief. You know, we were ready for these guys. And I asked him a few minutes later, I said, Captain, how are you feeling? He said, lovely mate. <laughs> <laughs> lovely mate. And uh, the final thing, the very cool thing about him and captains and generals and colonels and you know, just my uh, complete respect for uh, military leadership and all that is we were going to evacuate these guys off of this ship and leave it off the coast of Liberia while the company uh, set in for a tow that was going to take a long time. Mm -hmm. His final order to that crew, and I was right there when he did it, he said, if they're standing, they're staying. And I thought, you know, this is it's all World War II shit. Mm -hmm. now, meaning everyone on this ship that can still stand is going to stay on it and keep this ship afloat until they can get it recovered. Hmm. You are not leaving this ship. If you're standing, you're staying. And I never heard a better order come out of a guy that was in such bad shape. Just a tremendous amount of respect for him and the colonels and generals, all that shit. They're very cool guys. All yeah. it's, it's lonely at the top, you know? It's lonely at the top for a reason. But um, so uh, did you... Work for some great ones. Did you go through 18 Delta? No. No, you uh, went to civilian paramedic school? My daughter got run over right in front of me in Chesapeake Ugh. in our driveway. And how she survived it, I will never know. I, I actually superhumaned a truck off of her little tiny three-year-old shoulder blades. Ugh. And somehow she survived, and it was quite an ordeal for us. Uh, she never should have. And... I asked to go to EMT school. At that time, they were sending a lot of SEALs through EMT school. And because of that, because of what the paramedics did and the firefighters that were down there in the Nightingale helicopter mm -hmm. were pay a debt. And then they were offering an accelerated paramedic program to the corpsmen. And I don't know how much ass I kissed, but the next thing I know, I'm the first non-SEAL corpsman to go through paramedic school and I got my all my everything all my credentials and uh, I ran rescue in Virginia Beach and uh, for a, a number of years huh. I had a great time and I let it all go for Blackwater but I did that for a lot of years I paid back that debt and I'll tell you today if you're going to clutch your chest and fall over in front of somebody you need to do it in front of me man because I'm going to soak your ass up <laughs> and, uh, did a lot of good things, learned a lot as a paramedic, but that was a, that was a good test. Man, it was a lot of banged up dudes, and it was me and a corpsman in a squad. We had an officer, we had an engineering rep, we had a weapons rep, radio guy. We had everything a SEAL squad would have, and one corpsman that was a basic corpsman out of school, and mm -hmm. me as paramedic running that thing. And uh, just a great officer leading it, and we just had a good time, so. Yeah. That's awesome. Hey, brother, listen, I appreciate so much you coming on here and, and uh, doing this with me. Um, if I'm ever up in your neck of the woods, I'm going to look you up and buy you that beer. And uh, maybe we can tell some of them stories together that we can't really tell on this program. Well, we can drink the beer and shoot the ducks at the same time, man. All right. I, I would love to do that. But uh, get, you some, get you some oysters right off my dock here. So we'll there we be go. Set. Okay, let's do it. All right, brother. Uh, thanks again, everybody. Don Shipley, uh, badass, in my opinion. Um, all around good dude, funny son of a bitch, and uh, retired Navy SEAL. Hey, thank you, brother, again, and uh, I'll talk to you soon. Do that, and you have a good retirement. My best to your wife and you and uh, whatever you're going to do in the future. The Navy's great. It's also very cool when we get a little bit older and we retire out of that and start a new life. So uh, <laughs> maybe set you up well. You'll be fine, bro. Good luck, Shane. Absolutely. Mate. Thank you, brother. I'll You're talk welcome, to you soon. Bye-bye. Absolutely. Bye. -bye. Absolutely. Bye.